Hi, I'm Pastor Corey, and you're listening to the Orange United Methodist Sermon Podcast. We're a church in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, that wants to help you find your place in God's story. And we hope this sermon can guide you along that path. Visit orangemethodist.org to find out more information about location, service times, upcoming events, and ways to give. We hope you enjoy. This week, we continue our sermon series, Stones of Remembrance, and our scripture comes to us from the book of Joshua, chapter 4, verses 1 through 11, and actually 19 to 24. If you'd like to follow along in your uh, Bible that's here, you can turn to page 187, invite you to look along in your own Bibles as well. Hear now God's word. When the entire nation had finished crossing over the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, Select 12 men from the people, one from each tribe, and command them, Take 12 stones from here, out of the middle of the Jordan, from the place where the priest's feet stood. Carry them over with you, and lay them down in the place where you camp tonight. Then Joshua summoned the 12 men from the Israelites whom he had appointed, one from each tribe. Joshua said to them, Pass on before the ark of the Lord your God into the middle of the Jordan, and each of you take up a stone on his shoulder, one for each of the tribes of the Israelites, so that this may be a sign among you. When your children ask in time to come, what do those stones mean to you? Then you shall tell them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off in front of the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. When it crossed over the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. So these stones shall be to the Israelites a memorial forever. The Israelites did as Joshua commanded, and they took up 12 stones out of the middle of the Jordan, according to the number of tribes of the Israelites, as the Lord told Joshua. Carried them over with them to the place where they camped and laid them down there. Joshua set up 12 stones in the middle of the Jordan in the place where the feet of the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant had stood, and they are there to this day. The priests who bore the Ark remained standing in the middle of the Jordan until everything was finished that the Lord commanded Joshua to tell the people according to all that Moses had commanded Joshua. The people crossed over in haste. As soon as all the people had finished crossing over, the ark of the Lord and the priests crossed over in front of the people. The people came up out of the Jordan on the 10th day of the first month, and they camped in Gilgal on the east border of Jericho. Those 12 stones which they had taken out of the Jordan, Joshua set up in Gilgal, saying to the Israelites, when your children ask their parents in the time to come, what do these stones mean? Then you shall let your children know. Israel crossed over the Jordan here on dry ground. For the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan for you until you crossed over as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea, which he dried up for us until we crossed over, so that all the peoples of the earth may know that the hand of the Lord is mighty and so that you may fear the Lord your God forever. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God indeed. Good morning, church. I'm Adam Seat, lead pastor here at Orange, and I'm thankful for this opportunity to be with you today. Last Sunday, I was away as last weekend, we were celebrating a wedding in my family. My sister had twin boys 24 years ago, and over the past six weeks, both of them have gotten married. And so she is relieved at this point. But we were away in Edenton, North Carolina, for the wedding last weekend, and what a beautiful time to be away. But it's always good to come back home, and so it's good to be back here with you this morning. Let us go to God in prayer. Lord God, we come to this place to remember. We come to this place to offer words of praise. We come to this place to lift up songs, prayers, to hear your holy word and to receive. We come to remember who you are and who we are. And so speak to us today in this time. Lord, by the power of your Holy Spirit, would you transform the words that proceed from my mouth and as they fall upon our ears and penetrate our hearts, may they be changed into the word of God that we need to hear today as individuals and collectively as one body. Lord, we pray this in the name of Jesus and through the power of the Holy Spirit and all of God's people said, amen. As Pastor Corey said, today we are continuing in our summer sermon series. I said it fast. 
uh, try to get through it. Our summer sermon series, which is called Stones of Remembrance. We're taking uh, a, a few weeks to, to look at different times in the scripture where stones are referenced or, or rocks or things that are ways that we might overlook a lot of times. And so last week, Pastor Corey started us with that reminder from Genesis when Jacob slept and had this vivid dream, this encounter with God. And when he awoke, he took the stone that he had been sleeping on and he erected it as a pillar to be a remembrance, to mark that place for surely the presence of God is in this place and naming it Bethel, the house of God. So this week we're continuing as we look at another time. And, you know, as we are thinking about these stones, these images, you know, People place stones as memorials. People place stones as markers. And if you're observant around the town of Chapel Hill in particular, you'll see some similar stones that are stacked. Take a look at this first one. You might see this one is such a creative one. I want to ask, does anybody recognize, do you know where this stack of stones is? Highway 54, exactly. That's right, right over there by the Friday Center. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, it, that one is so creative. I had to go up really close to take a picture and to see. Somebody might have been an engineer that put this one together because they knew how to stack them just right to have that circle. But if you go by, it changes from time to time. People will go out and just rearrange them. There's, there's another one that's really close to where we are right now. Uh, take a look at this one. This one, some of you, I bet, drove past this one on the way here this morning. Anybody recognize where this set of stones might be? That's right. Right down here on the other side of the street, just past the stoplight on the left, right there on the steps leading up to where IFC is. And in fact, if you go up those steps, you'll see there are several stones that are stacked in that way. Sometimes people stack stones as just an artistic expression. Sometimes they stack stones as a way of guiding you along a trail to let you know where turns should be. Sometimes stones are stacked in such a way really as a memorial. I mean, Many of us may remember watching an old cowboy movie and when they bury someone might have a stack of stones upon that grave marking where that person is. These, these ways that stones are used form a powerful memory. And today we're looking at a stack of stones that were there very intentionally, very purposefully. And so let's get into the context of it. Pastor Corey read that scripture just a few moments ago, but to understand that in full context, we really got to go back to the book of Exodus. And in the book of Exodus, we learn about how God calls upon Moses to go to Egypt so that the people of Israel who have been held in captivity for so many years to finally be set free. This seems like an impossible task. For Moses, And so Moses tries to bargain his way out of it. He tries to figure out a way that God could send anyone else but him. But God, God doesn't see the impossible task. God sees the possibility when God goes with him. And ultimately, Moses agrees. And you know the story. Moses goes to Pharaoh and he encounters Pharaoh. And God keeps hardening Pharaoh's heart. His heart continues to be hardened. Even one plague after another, Pharaoh refuses until... Finally, the final plague, it really hits too close to home for Pharaoh. And so he changes his heart. Just get out. Just leave. Whatever, just leave. And so the people of Israel, they begin to scramble. They get out and they are heading out. And Moses is leading them as God is leading them. And as God is leading Moses, Moses is leading them out to the Red Sea. And you can imagine the people who are uncertain about this course of direction that they're going. Because as they are approaching the Red Sea, there's a mountain on this side, a mountain on that side, and a body of water in front of them. And they learn that Pharaoh's heart has changed once again. And Pharaoh has sent his armies in full pursuit with chariots and horses, chasing after the people of Israel. Once again, this is an impossible situation. But they have forgotten that God is the God of the impossible. And so God instructs Moses to take his staff and to raise his arms and raise the staff. And the waters begin to part. And you can imagine the people of Israel who finally see this way through. They are rushing their way through on dry ground. And as they get to the other side, Moses lowers his arms and the waters 
cover the people of Egypt, the Egyptian army that has been pursuing them. Oh, the scripture talks about the jubilant song that they sang in that time, praising God for how God has delivered them from this impossible situation. But God has done the impossible. God has saved his people. And so they then are to continue on. And as Moses is to lead them to the promised land, you remember, it it really only should have taken them about 11 days to get all the people there. But they sent spies into the promised land. And the spies come back with a report. No, we can't do it. It's impossible. They're like giants to us. We're going to be consumed by them. It's, it's just not possible. Even though what they had just experienced, they now have to spend 40 years wandering in this wilderness, wandering around and, and stumbling. And many times I've looked at that part about how they forgot that in this impossible situation, God was still the God of the impossible. And so they spend this 40 years in the wilderness. And I tell you, a lot of times I think about that time of that 40 years. And it's easy for me to think about how they wasted time, all this time that they're wandering around. But it was in that time that they were taught that God truly is the God of the impossible. God is a God of provision. When they were thirsty, God provided water through the rock. When they were hungry, God provided sustenance through the manna and through the quail. When they were in the wilderness, they were taught that God is a God of guidance and direction. For they were led by the pillar of fire and the cloud. They were taught these things to be able to depend upon this God. God even gives them this law that sets them apart from all the other nations. And they were given a constant reminder of God's constant presence with them. That constant reminder being the tabernacle, how God gives them the instructions about building up the tabernacle, this massive tent. And within that tabernacle, they would offer sacrifices. Within that tabernacle would continue be that presence of God, the Ark of the Covenant. I mean, the Ark of the Covenant itself would be that presence, that physical reminder that God is always faithful. God is always with them. And so... Those 40 years, they weren't really wasted. God was continuing to build up his people. But now the time has come. Moses has died, and Joshua has ascended into being the leader. And it is time now to enter the promised land. But once again, they face an impossible situation. You see, the Jordan River is not really, especially now, as water is being siphoned off in different places, but in that day and time, the Jordan River was a river, but it wasn't that substantial of a river, except for in the springtime, when the snows and ice began to melt, the water would grow and the floodplains would be as wide as one mile. You've got two million people in this journey that are coming, going to have to cross the Jordan River. Like I said, normally it would not be that big of a task. But two million people to cross a body of water as significant as this? Once again, it's an impossible task. But God is the God of the impossible. And so God gives Moses, uh, Joshua, the instructions of how they're going to do it. God tells Joshua to get the priest to take the Ark of the Covenant the very symbol of God's presence, the very symbol of the reminder of the covenant that God has established with them. They are to take the covenant and the the Ark of the Covenant and the priests are to carry it into the Jordan River. Every time I read it, it just reminds me that the feet had got to get wet first before the river would part. They had to step into the river with the most precious thing that they had. The Ark of the Covenant. I can only imagine if I was one of the priests having received that instruction from Joshua that we're supposed to take the Ark of the Covenant into the river. Yeah, I'm not going to be held responsible if this thing gets washed away. That's what I would be thinking. They had to step into the water first. And when they did, when they stepped into the water, the water began to pile up. The ground was dry. And they were able to cross cross on dry ground into the promised land. But that's where it gets fascinating, and that's where we pick up the scripture that was read today. While they cross over, 
Joshua goes back into the river, taking 12 stones, and he stacks them inside in the riverbed, in the dry riverbed. And as she read it, they still stand there to this day. Do they stand? I don't know. I would think erosion would have washed them away by now. But he instructs then each tribe to take one person, to go into the dry riverbed, and to take out a stone. Scripture says that they are to take out that stone and they're carrying it on their shoulder. You can imagine it probably wasn't just a little pebble that you would do as a skipping stone. It's probably one of these that really took some heft to really some effort to try to carry it out. And so each one went in and they got the stones and brought them out. Here's where it gets interesting to me. Joshua then takes each stone representing a tribe, representing one of the tribes. I can almost visualize how reverent he was doing this and naming the tribe as he placed it. People are watching as he begins to build this monument. And I imagine when he lifts up their particular tribe, that's us, that's our tribe, and place it. Some are large, some are small, just like the numbers in their tribes. And as he continues to build this monument, <clears throat> I'm sure there are questions. Why are we building this monument? And Joshua explains that when your children ask, what is the meaning of these stones? You shall tell them how God the Lord God Almighty, I, I have a specific order here. <laughs> I got to make sure I get it right. How the Lord God Almighty stopped the waters up. When they were faced with the impossible, the Lord God Almighty made the possible. And as he's building it, probably better than I am. <laughs> Can't take it for granted. Granted. Sorry. <laughs> now the drone is coming. He's building the monument. Because he knows that while right now they may feel victorious. Right now they may feel like God has done the impossible once again. They may truly believe right now that God is the God of the impossible. That all things are possible through God. He knows that there's going to come a time that they will once again forget. He knows that there will come a time that they may forget that God is the one that makes all things possible. And so he tells them to have this stone of remembrance, this memorial, as a way of every time they look at it, they might be able to be reminded that God is who he says he is. And you are who God says you are. You are a child of God. Amen. And so the people of Israel, whenever they would be facing those battles, whenever they would find those times that they were doubting, whenever they felt like they were at the end of their rope, whenever they felt like they were worthless, they could come and look and be reminded that God is the God of faithfulness. God is always faithful. He will never forsake you. When they left the Red Sea, they forgot that God was the God of the impossible. But now they shall never forget that God is the God of the impossible. And friends, I don't know about you, but there are times that I've got to be reminded that God is who he says he is. That's why we come together to worship on Sundays, to be reminded, to have these stones of remembrance spoken into our lives that says God loves you and there's nothing you could ever do to be separated from the love of God. We come here to be reminded that God is who God said God was. The Lord God Almighty and all things become possible through God. And we may beat ourselves up and the world may beat us down, but that doesn't stop who God is and that doesn't stop who God has called you to be. You may be in these moments right now. I mean, life is hard. Day in and day out, it feels like we're getting punched in the gut. And we don't know what to do. Anxiety and worry filling us. And so many times in my mind, I'm writing the end of the story long before God is writing it. 
Our lives may be in the midst of a season of drought, and everything seems dry and stale. <clears throat> Joshua knows that for the people of Israel, there will come another time. There will come another time that seems impossible. We know that in, even if things are good right now in our own lives, there's going to come a time. There's going to come another time. It may be even right now. But the character in the drought will be rewarded in the harvest. And today we're reminded of the faithfulness of God and that what God has led you to, God will lead you through. And today, may we find those stones of remembrance in our lives. May we look back at those times that say it was impossible, but God made it possible. May we look in our own personal journey to look back to where those stones are in our life and be reminded that if God did it before, if we saw God do it once, God can do it again. And the battles that we're facing today, they're not done yet. God's still writing your story. I don't know how it stayed up. <laughs> but I know that God is reminding us today to look for those stones of remembrance in your life. Let us pray. Lord God, you are faithful. Even when we may be faithless, you remain faithful. You are always the one that is constantly present, offering us guidance, encouragement, hope, even when we may not see it, even when we may not feel it. God, may we look back to those stones of remembrance, those, those monuments in our lives that prove to us that we have seen the impossible become possible through you. And you're not done yet. So God, may we cling ever so tightly to the hope as we remember your faithfulness. We pray these things in the name of our Lord and Jesus and through the power of the Holy Spirit and all of God, God's people said, amen. Thanks for listening to this week's sermon. Please join us again next week. In the meantime, you can find us online at orangemethodist.org.